All right, so Tudor released another Rolex homage. We can talk about it. Never break, always fight, never quit, do it right. So this past week, Tudor released their Ranger field watch. Should we say they re-released the Ranger because the Tudor Ranger has been a watch that uh, has been out before in different iterations. Hans Wilsdorf, who founded Tudor and Rolex, actually registered the Ranger name shortly after Tudor was founded, which was a smart move on his part because if you're gonna be making a field watch, is there really a better name than Ranger? I mean, field watches really started coming into their own after World War II. And then the robustness of the field watch grew through exploratory feats throughout the 20th century. So back in the 60s and 70s, uh, you could tell the features that different Tudor watches had by their name. So for example, they would have a Tudor Oyster watch. The Oyster meant that it was just in an Oyster case those ones would typically be a manual wind. They also had a oyster date, right? So it's an oyster case, it would have a date feature. Tudor also had their oyster prints. Now the word prints meant that it was an automatic winding movement. So back when Tudor started releasing their Ranger, they were part of the oyster prints line. They didn't have their own unique model number or serial number. They were just mixed in with other oyster princes in production. So you'd have an oyster prints Ranger. That just meant that it was an oyster case, prints meaning that it's an automatic movement, and then Ranger would have, you know, the Ranger dial, right? This is made to be a field watch. So 1953, while the big brother Rolex was outfitting watches for the summit of Mount Everest, famously done by Shredman, Hillary, and Tenzing Norgay and their crew. So Tudor, instead of supplying watches to summit Everest, right, this awesome feat, they gave 26 watches to a group of scientists and some military um, explorers while Britain did another expedition of North Greenland. Now, I, I wonder how many people that are interested in buying the Ranger are jumping on Wikipedia this week to look up the British expedition of North Greenland, because really, who cared about it? right? Like, can you, could you name one person that was part of that expedition? The scientists went up to North Greenland to study glaciers and study seismology and just all this like nerdy scientific stuff. And this was an expedition that lasted two years. So of the crew that was up there, it wasn't like the same crew the whole time. Different scientists and different crew members would show up to the, the bases up there and do their stint, take their measure, measurements for so long. And then, then they would get the F out of there because who wants to chill at North Greenland for two years, right? Now, during the expedition, a lot of the seismological and gravimetric surveys, as well as the radio wave propagation studies were conducted at a facility that was codenamed North Ice. Now, you might think that's really cool, but hey, if uh, that sells watches, you know, lean into it, I guess. And so Tudor supplied these 26 Tudor Oyster Prince watches to members of this crew, and they were able to utilize them for timekeeping, and I'm sure it was it was useful for Tudor. Back in the 1950s, it was actually something to be able to make an automatic watch that would maintain its accuracy in extreme environmental conditions, like extreme cold or wind, that kind of thing. So you can't really fault Tudor for um, you know supplying those timepieces. Now, the Rolex Explorer summiting Everest Rolex immediately used that into advertising, and the Explorer ended up being a pretty big hit for them. Even among collectors today, they really love vintage Explorers, right? An Explorer uh, 1016, it's a beautiful watch. A couple years ago, Rolex ended up discontinuing their 39 millimeter Rolex Explorer. Some people were a little bit upset about that. They re-released it in a more modest 36 millimeter design. And some people would even say that the 36 millimeter case is more truly the authentic size of the Explorer's watch. The Tudor Oyster Princes actually were, I believe, 34 millimeters at the time of the North Greenland expedition. But Rolex's latest iteration of this Explorer on steel, it's over 7,000 US dollars. 
Now they have it on two-tone, so they have it in gold and steel. And for the MSRP of the two-tone versions, those are up over $11,000. So realistically, Rolex has kind of evolved and moved up market to where the Explorer really isn't the best field watch anymore. You also have to consider in the 1950s, having an accurate three-hander was great for exploration. But decades later, Rolex released the Explorer 2. The Rolex Explorer 2 is a very reliable watch. It also gives you a quick set uh, hour hand. It gives you a GMT hand and also gives you a date in a small compact package with great shock resistance. And so when you look at some of the more modern Explorers, most of them aren't just taking simple three-handed automatic watches anymore. So anytime Rolex releases a new iteration of a watch, obviously the vintage collectors, they go crazy for the discontinued models. But Rolex doesn't make a lot of money on the sale of old 1016s. They don't make any money when uh, someone sells their 39 millimeter Explorer because it's discontinued. Rolex already made their money up front when they sold the watch. So how does Rolex make money on that secondary market? Well, that's where Tudor comes along. Because Tudor's kind of a Rolex homage brand. A lot of the watches that they have are taking styling from Big Brother Rolex. So even when you look at the Tudor Ranger, even the original Tudor Rangers, those ones looked very similar to the Rolex Explorer of the day. Sure, Tudor might take off the triangle marker at 12 and put on the Arabic 12 numeral to make it a little bit different. Okay, fine. But there's no denying that Tudor gets its inspiration from the original Rolex designs which are awesome. You can't deny that in the 20th century, Rolex was creating some of the best automatic tool watches out there. And that's really how Rolex made their name. Decades ago, Rolex watches were being sold in military stores. And even when the Rolexes were being sold in these military stores, they were still twice as expensive as a comparable Zodiac Seawolf next to it. But Rolex cut their teeth and they made their name through the 20th century by making reliable, well-built timepieces. So now Tudor's able to kind of capitalize on some of that nostalgia. Tudor might be able to get a little bit of money out of those vintage collectors by releasing a Rolex Explorer homage. So me as a buyer, if I'm looking at buying a Rolex 1016, I have to take on a lot of risk. Was the watch serviced? Is it a Franken watch? What are the conditions of the seals? There's all those things you have to worry about when you're purchasing a used watch on the secondary market. But now Tudor releases a 39 millimeter watch that is vintage inspired for $3,000, which is less than a used Rolex Explorer. And the Tudor even has the latest and greatest tech. The Tudor Ranger movement, the MT, I believe it's the 5402, that's the same Kinesi movement that is in the Tudor Black Bay 58. I personally own two Black Bay 58s and I haven't had any problem with the movement. A 70 hour COSC certified movement that's gonna be in good shape. It's not as good as a modern Rolex movement, but it's pretty close. It gets you most of the way there. They have the silicone balance spring, they have a full balance bridge, a reasonable amount of shock resistance, the kind of things that you would want in a field watch. Now one thing about Rolex is they've always been really good at marketing. Tudor lacks a little bit, but I guess you have to give them uh, an A for effort. Me personally, the British North Greenland expedition, like what the F is that? I don't really connect with that story at all, but hey, the 70 year anniversary of the beginning of the expedition is as good a time as any is releasing a Rolex homage watch, right? So, hey, Tudor went with it. Now, when you're trying to decide if this is a good watch to add to your collection, I think you really just need to look at your lifestyle and see what it is, right? You're getting a $3,000 watch. It has a painted dial. It has a predominantly brushed case. There's a little bit of polishing around the fixed bezel, uh, but otherwise it's a brushed case. It does come with Tudor's new T-Fit clasp, which is awesome. I'm glad they took off the faux rivets finally, so it sounds like Tudor is maybe listening to its customers. But Tudor is always finding a way to trip at the finish line. Some of the things that I don't like about it. So number one, with it being an all brushed case, I wish they would have done a polished chamfer between the flanks and the top of the lugs. I think that would have added a lot of visual interest. Number two, I don't really like the font on the dial. I think they could have maybe done a better job with those Arabic numerals. I think the text on the dial is kind of placed historically correct, but I don't think it's visually appealing. 
I think the Tudor logo should be brought down a little bit from the 12 o'clock. And I think the Ranger text at the six o'clock position of the dial, I think could be a little bit higher on the dial. A little bit closer to the center would be more appealing. Number three, we gotta talk about that hour hand. Yes, I do understand that that's an hour hand that's a little bit more similar to the previous models, but I didn't like the hour hand on the previous models. It looks a little uh, phallic to me. Some people have even been lovingly referring to it as the butt plug hour hand. So once you see it, you can't unsee it. Eh, not for me. I really wish they would have just used the snowflake hour hand. I mean, it would have looked fine on this dial. They can't do anything perfectly. I think they did a good job with the case measurements. It's a 39 millimeter wide case. I don't quite know what the thickness is, but the profile photos of it looks very similar to the Black Bay 58 case. Um, it just doesn't have a rotating bezel. So even if it was as thick as a Black Bay 58 case, I think that's totally usable as a field watch. One of the things that has yet to be seen is will this Tudor Ranger bracelet fit onto the Black Bay 58. That would be awesome. So where does this uh, Tudor Ranger fit in the market? Well, to people that are comparing it to a Rolex Explorer, it might seem like a really good purchase. But when I think about a field watch, a simple three-handed field watch, I kind of want to use it as an Explorer's watch. Use it when you're hiking. You're able to kind of use a field watch as a beater. And so that $3,000 price point is kind of a hurdle that you have to get around. Because, I mean, you can think about the Hamilton Khaki King. You can buy these all day for around 400, under $500. And it's giving you a 40 millimeter case, a really thin profile. It's giving you a day and a date complication. And it gives you over 70 hours of power reserve. That's a pretty good field watch. And another thing about the Hamilton is it has pretty unique styling. I mean, you can look at a Hamilton field watch and you know it's a Hamilton. Watches like the Seiko Alpinist have a lot of history behind them and offer you a good package for around a thousand dollars. When you look at the Tudor Ranger, you kind of think it looks like a Rolex Explorer. And even if you can get past the whole Rolex homage thing, well now you gotta ask yourself, is it worth getting the Tudor Ranger over the Smith's Everest? I don't know, that's kind of up to you as a buyer. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of homages. So those are my thoughts on the new Tudor Ranger. I don't even really care to get my hands on one because it's probably not gonna fit um, into my collection. So let me know your thoughts, guys. And remember, wear your watches. Yeah,